Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about world affairs and the people who shape it. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch, and in this show we discuss topical global issues and have in-depth conversations with personalities in foreign policy. Global Dispatches is presented in partnership with Humanity in Action, an international educational organization, and I am a Humanity in Action senior fellow. With Houston still reeling from Hurricane Harvey, Irma causing massive havoc in the Caribbean, and yet more storms on the way, I thought it would be interesting and timely to speak with my guest today, Maria Ivanova. She is an academic who straddles the university and policy worlds to help think through connections between human security, environmental stresses, and global governance. That is, the mechanisms that the international community and beyond have designed to deal with environmental challenges. And in this conversation, she helps put the onslaught of these hurricanes into a kind of broader context that addresses how the international community might more productively organize itself to confront the realities of climate change. Maria is a professor of global governance and director for governance and sustainability at the John W. McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies at UMass Boston. She is also ambassador of the New Shape Prize of the Global Challenges Foundation. This is a $5 million prize that will be awarded next year to the best ideas that re-envision global governance for the 21st century. And towards the end of this conversation, we discuss exactly what that means and why you should be involved. This is a timely and interesting conversation with someone who has spent a great deal of time studying the interactions between people and the environment and our global institutions to deal with people and the environment. So enjoy this conversation with Professor Maria Ivanova. As always, feel free to get in touch with me via globaldispatchespodcast.com where you can send me an email. If you're a loyal listener to the podcast, please do leave a review on iTunes. It really does help uh, spread the word about the podcast to other would-be podcast listeners. People are interested in these kinds of you know, under-the-radar global affairs issues that that I often cover on this show. So please do leave a review on iTunes, get in touch with me. Or if you have any questions or comments, you can always, of course, hit me up on Twitter at Mark L. Goldberg. Okay, now here is my conversation with Maria Ivanova. That I always love when the people I interview also happen to be listeners of the show. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just listened to the Somalian climate change, and I mean that's it's really relevant. I want I want my students all to listen to that when I come back from sabbatical next semester. I'll be teaching about uh, environmental issues in the Horn of Africa. So uh, you will be required listening. Okay, well, <laughs> required thank you. reading. Thank You'll you. be required listening perfect, to our, our students. <laughs> Um, so I, okay. I'm, I'm interested in learning how you are approaching these, these hurricanes. I mean, as we're speaking now, Harvey hit a week ago. Irma is making its way towards Florida and there are several other hurricanes that have formed in the Atlantic. Like how, how are you approaching these back to back to back to back hurricanes? All of us approach these, first of all, as humans, um, as people who, connect to these crises, to their human dimensions, to their social dimensions, to their uh, impact on other people's lives and on societies, and then as, as professionals. So as, uh, as a human, I, I have been deeply disturbed by what is, what is happening to uh, the people in, the, uh, in, in Texas, in Louisiana, in, in Florida, uh, and as a professional, I cannot help but think about the causes, the consequences, and the solutions in, in such circumstances. And when we have such back-to-back calamities, uh, you cannot help but think about what the causes are. And uh, climate change is certainly a factor. It is an amplifier. It is an exacerbator of, of the risks. But the other uh, great or significant cause is the explosive urban growth in those areas, 
without regard for ecological sustainability, for the ecological risks, for the resilience. And so these, these two main factors, climate change and uh, explosive urban, urban growth come out as the, as the key causes. And then when you think about the consequences, they're, they're both human and, and economic, and they're so deeply disruptive. I was just reading about uh, the estimates now of uh, the, cause, the uh, costs, economic costs of Harvey, and they range between 90 and uh, $190 billion. And not to speak then of the costs on, uh, on human life in terms of health, in terms of education. Schools cannot start their school year. Um, and then, as all professionals, we have to think about solutions, right? And uh, how do we think of rebuilding after such, such disasters? And uh, so I... I have been thinking about the opportunities that that these that these calamities provide, rather than just the risks and so, the threats. I, I know that you have helped establish a PhD program that examines uh, how populations interact with coasts uh, around around the the, the coast of, of of Boston. Right? It's a it's a UMass Boston program. Yes. So we actually it's a collaborative uh, endeavor initiative uh, between uh, several schools on on our campus and uh, we we submitted a proposal to the National Science Foundation together with the Dean of the School for the Environment and uh, received a 3.1 million grant to look at coasts and communities in Boston in coastal Massachusetts but also in the Horn of Africa uh, our major partner there was Ethiopia. And even though Ethiopia does not have a coast on the ocean, when we think of coasts and communities, we think about uh, river basins, about lakes, about how humans relate to, uh, to their environment uh, in, in terms of large or even smaller water, water bodies. So, so what do like your average non-academic, just you know, people who are interested in the world and the environment need to know about... Um, how people and communities interact with coasts in context of something like a hurricane Harvey. So uh, humans have uh, inhabited coasts for the longest time. Uh, in a sense, my interest in the environment came exactly from, from this area, from coasts and how people relate to water bodies. Uh, I come originally from Bulgaria, but I came to the United States in 1992 and studied at Mount Holyoke College and took a number of classes at UMass Amherst. And one of them on Scandinavian government and politics was really what struck me in, to push and pushed me into the environmental arena because we discussed how people in Europe connect with water bodies Basically, they are connected through water bodies, through rivers, through seas. They use them as connectors. And how in the United States, water actually isolates. People in the United States are isolated from the rest of the world, in a sense, by these two big oceans, the Atlantic and the Pacific. And so it's really interesting how people have connected to their, how communities have connected to, to coasts in different parts of the world. And so... When we think about coasts, we have to put them into this larger setting. It's almost anthropological, right? Of how do people see their connection with their, with their environment? And this is where a lot of the risks come, uh, especially in the context of a hurricane like, like Harvey and the other ones that are coming up the coasts now, is when, when you are inhabiting coasts without regard for the deep kind of ecological boundaries and limits that that environment has. For example, building and paving all of the wetlands uh, in, in Houston reduces your um, ability, reduces your resilience and increases uh, your, your vulnerability because the coast is now, has been subjected to, to such uh, in a sense, almost violent uh, pressure that is not able to withstand the, the natural hazards and, and the risks. So we have to rethink 
how we how we relate to to our environment and then bringing several phd programs from the sciences from global governance from business into a common cohort has really allowed us to think in a in a very integrated and transdisciplinary way about those issues um, is is the international community approaching um, like hurricanes specifically in in the right way? I mean, it seems that mm-hmm. it's just wrapped up in um, in in uh, you know your regular disaster response, and there's nothing sort of broader beyond you know a disaster response and preparedness that the international community is mm-hmm. contributing to, you know, the conversation around these, these kinds of, of massive storms. And I suppose not just hurricanes, but also, you know, uh, uh, monsoons in, on, on the other side of the world as well. That's right, because we call them hurricanes here, right? Mm-hmm. But they, they come Cyclones. with different, yes, different names around, uh, around the world. Um, I think you're, you're, you're right that we are approaching them from this disaster uh, in this disaster framework and uh, in the international community, the kind of the latest thinking is through this, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Mm-hmm. But can, can you not, it, it just explain, unpack that a little bit. Cause yes. Sendai is, it was a conference in Japan uh, that right. was around, that was a big, a big UN conference that focused on how to um, make countries more resilient against these kinds of exogenous shocks that natural disasters bring. So was that, I mean, to what extent was that like a turning point in how the international community approaches these kinds of things? I think it was, it, it was really a turning point indeed uh, because this resa- disaster risk reduction framework has now permeated kind of the, the, the governance thinking within the United Nations and therefore the, uh, the international community. And so there is much more structured thinking about hazards, about vulnerability, about preparedness, response and recovery. And uh, when there is structured thinking at the international level that enables us to go to countries with uh, with concrete uh, support, with uh, policy measures, with uh, um, all kinds of different activities that could be done before and uh, and after a disaster strikes. So the um, there are also specific indicators that uh, enable countries to monitor for disasters and and prepare. So I do think that that was a, a turning point. Mm-hmm. So so um, can I say for for example it looks yes. like with Hurricane Irma like Barbuda got mm-hmm. just destroyed. Um like the, the the pictures I've seen are are pretty horrendous. It basically looks like the the entire island was was flattened. So yes. that will presumably require a kind of rebuilding and and so will like the national government of Barbuda and in conjunction with international aid and, and the UN kind of be using this framework to approach their rebuilding efforts. Is that, is that the idea? In a sense, you approach through this framework, the, the prevention part mm-hmm. of, uh, of this okay. and preparedness, but also then the, the recovery. Um, mm-hmm. So a lot of it is about being prepared um, and that again goes back into, in a sense, the rebuilding, because now we have to rebuild in a way that increases, enhances our preparedness for future events, uh, because those hazards are not going away. The only thing we need to, um, we could do better is actually Im- decrease our vulnerability and increase the resilience through various social measures, economic measures and environmental um, measures and, and, and so forth. So, um, but to, to just come back to the point that you raised, whether the, the disaster risk reduction uh, approach to, to hurricanes or other such uh, um, events is, is limiting, I, I think it's actually enabling a broader, a broader look at hurricanes rather than limiting to uh, to disasters because they hurricanes are disasters. Um, so it, I would see that framework as as actually putting putting hurricanes into a much a much broader framework. 
Um, it, it also seems, you know, these these hurricanes are hitting uh, at a time which is just, you know, weeks before a lot of world leaders, most world leaders will be gathering in, in New York for the UN General Assembly. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. I, I know that you've worked within the UN system to you know, be an, an advisor on how the UN should approach some environmental issues in, in, in the past. Like, how do you see these disasters influencing the conversation and, and debate in New York during the General Assembly? What else can be done within the UN system to bolster how the international community, you know, prevents these kinds of things from happening in, in, in the future? So a, a couple of questions in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are these are very good and very very rich questions, and we we could have extensive conversations about uh, each of them now before. And I would like after the general assembly and see actually what indeed happens uh, during those those discussions. Uh, but a few a few thoughts on on that. I do think uh, that world leaders will indeed discuss uh, these these issues in terms of both the risks that are being posed, but also then the ability of the international community and of countries themselves to respond to the, to the disasters. So uh, in terms of the, of the United Nations and the global governance systems, uh, there are a few things that the system has been set up to, to do. And it is to assist countries with the knowledge and awareness about these uh, these issues with then preparedness and it can be in physical in terms of infrastructure or or in policy terms in terms of legal regulatory frameworks and then importantly with a political commitment and policy measures uh, and uh, finally with support it can be financial it can be um, uh, in kind in terms of f- food and other other support and re- in rebuilding. So we will see the United Nations engage in all of those in those areas. It usually does so in uh, in developing countries, right? In countries where the capacity is uh, is not there to to do any of those things. So we won't see the the United Nations coming into um, that close of a of a relationship in the United States where, we have been hit severely by by these uh, hurricanes, but you will see uh, that action in Bermuda. And uh, I do wonder indeed what the conversations will be in New York at the General Assembly in terms of the impact on developed countries and on uh, less developed countries and how the United Nations and the governance systems that that we have can respond to to these challenges in all of of these countries. And in a sense, the sustainable development goals that were uh, uh, adopted by governments unanimously at the end of 2015, these 17 sustainable development goals, are for the first time in, uh, in UN history, they're actually applicable universally, meaning to all countries. And so all of the countries are now expected to work to implement these goals. And one of them, for example, is on having sustainable cities, which will reflect on the preparedness for hurricanes, the response to hurricanes. Um, So I do see uh, the September meetings as as an important flag post for these for these discussions but i do think that the actions that the international community will start taking uh, will be will be immediate now in the aftermath of the of the hurricanes and it will be interesting to see uh, what they are in different in in different settings in different countries so so what do these hurricanes or or maybe you know climate change challenges more broadly mm-hmm. um, tell you uh, about like the current state of of global governance around these issues and and where it can be improved or um, built upon so yes yeah, so you climate climate change as a as a global risk or as a global reality indeed. Uh, has now dominated the, the global discourse for 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 a while, and uh, it was really empowering to see what happened in Paris in 2015 and how all countries of uh, of the world adopted the Paris Agreement, committed to 
implementing it. And it was very disheartening to see the United States pull out of that. So it is it is important now to reinvigorate that debate and uh, and have countries engage fully, despite, in a sense, this this um, kind of lowered expectations on on the part of the United States. And many of us in who work on climate change, on environmental issues, on global governance issues, actually hope that um, in the United States we can now see the need to deal with the with the issue and uh, the need to rethink policy. Um, and so the silver lining in, in this is that we have to acknowledge the causes for for these calamities and climate change is a definite accelerator of uh of the negative impacts of these of these hazards and so we have to create the necessary institutions the necessary policies measures and actions and what was really empowering and um inspiring to see during the paris uh negotiations was that businesses especially in the united states the powerful businesses pushed for for governmental action and i actually hope that with what happened now with the hurricanes with these uh, global risks that are hitting the united states we can re-engage that community in a much more powerful way and you see you saw states such as california come out and say we will um honor our commitments and we will act accordingly. So I actually hope that that we can re-energize those commitments and uh, implement them uh, as agreed years ago. And and uh, there is um, like a, a political moment right now, at, at least, in which there is this kind of growing acceptance that, you know, climate change is obviously, you know, for everyone, an accelerator of these of these calamities. But you know, the political response here has been, oh, it's it's too soon to talk about it, too soon, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but but there is this kind of, you know, uh, the consensus was already there. Um, there was just like, a, I think, a lack of political will by, you know, a, lo- a lot of you know, powerful people in government, by, you know, pre- uh, principally Republicans and, and, and the Trump administration. But there, I mean, it's just like too obvious to ignore at this point. Correct. Correct. And I... I really do think that a lot of the impetus and the push for a new response will come from the business community that has been impacted tremendously by these issues and from communities, um, local communities, who will have to demand that government does things differently. Um, so I wanted to switch gears a little bit, though not dramatically. And have you talk a little bit about your involvement with the New Shape Prize um, mm-hmm. and the Global Challenges Foundation, which, frankly, is, is is seems quite related to the conversation we are having now. It's my understanding that this foundation is is looking for new ideas and has like a pretty big prize. I think it's like a five or $5 million prize yes, for yes. new ideas in global government in global governance to how mm-hmm. to deal with these kinds of catastrophic risks that we as a you know, species face. The one of which is, is, is climate change. Um, so I have been appointed as an ambassador for the Global Challenges uh, Foundation and uh, the New Shape Prize, basically to bring this uh, opportunity out through the network of uh, experts uh, and um, others that we have convened over the years. I have been working on global environmental governance since the late, the late 1990s and uh, tried to figure out how we could create uh, reform the institutions uh, that we have internationally to deliver better results on the environmental side. And uh, in, it's in this uh, sense that uh, the Global Challenges Foundation reached out to me and asked that uh, that I become an ambassador for, for the foundation and the prize in particular. Um, so we are in the, in the process of forming a, a jury to evaluate the applications uh, that 
will come in. The deadline, by the way, is September 30th for submitting uh, applications for this $5 million prize. It, uh, it will be, it, it's, a pro, it's a global call for the best ideas that re-envision global governance. Um, in a what sense, do you mean by global governance? Yes, and uh, here's the slip of the tongue that you had, you know, global government, and it's governance and government are very different uh, concepts. So governance, I define it, and I helped, I was part of a team that helped create a PhD program in global governance and human security at, at UMass Boston. So um, we define governance uh, very often with every new cohort of students that comes in. And so I usually ask my students to define governance, but I'll, I'll give you my definition here. Um, I, I approach governance as the design and execution of policy. And uh, it is a system of uh, instruments, of institutions that uh, are created to be able to resolve various problems. And so governance happens at all levels. There is local governance, there is national governance, and there is global governance. But it also happens for various issues. So I work on global environmental governance, but there is health governance, there is economic governance. Um, and so in the design and execution of policies, we have multiple actors. We have governments participate, but not exclusively. We have civil society, businesses. And so it is that richness of actors and institutions that actually creates the system of governance. So it is a complex picture, but uh, it is a fascinating field that uh, truly illustrates the various, uh, the interconnectedness of the various issues and the necessary transdisciplinary approach to um, to any response to to those issues, but why, why do we need like a, a new approach to it? Why why are why do we need new ideas? Um, we always need new ideas, Mark, about anything, right? I <laughs> but, like the UN. Uh, the UN's all right. It's an old um, idea. Well, it is it, use some improvement. Exactly, but there are new ideas about what kind of improvement is is necessary. So the UN was created seventy years ago. Right after the Second World War, and only by the winners of the Second World War, only the countries that were on the winning side participated in the creation of the United Nations. Um, and uh, it its main idea was to secure peace in the world, peace and uh, and security. As we have evolved as a global society, more issues have emerged on the agenda. More countries have become member states of the United Nations. It is now close to 200 countries that are member, member states of the UN, 195. Um, and uh, it, it is important, it is actually critical that we are able to address global problems, whether they're environmental or security related or health related, in a way that ensures a global collective action. Because we now realize that uh, political, political boundaries do not stop epidemics, they do not stop uh, pollution or, or climate change. And for us to be able to address any of those threats and to respond to them adequately, we need to uh, act collectively and in a collaborative rather than a confrontational manner. And the United Nations is there as the institution to set up those mechanisms. However, because it was created 70 years ago, there are certain elements that are outdated. And uh, this is why the New Shape Prize is not about rebuilding or building a new system, but it is to re-envision, to have ideas for reform, for reinvigoration of, of that system. And it is truly an unprecedented effort to convene a global community that is large and relevant to ideate on, uh, on global governance and, uh, and its reform. What is unique about this, this call for proposals, it 
actually allows for applications in all six UN languages, which is mm-hmm. it's it's absolutely staggering. It's unique. Uh, so you can you can send in an application in English, in Russian, in French, in Arabic, in Chinese, in Spanish, um, and it will be reviewed appropriately. And, uh, and if you send in all five, do you get a uh, five times chance of winning? <laughs> no, one one application counts <laughs> only once. Um, but you see what I mean by allowing people to really apply in their own language. Mm-hmm. It, it expands the um, the group of people, the community, enormously, and allowing anyone, groups or individuals, to uh, to apply, to send in their ideas. And uh, we are now in the process of creating the process for evaluation um, in all of the languages, in all of the the intricacies of of having such. Uh, uh, such a contest, and so I, I'm honored to be to be part of that effort. And uh, it would be fascinating to see the types of ideas that come in, and then uh, work with uh, with colleagues on on selecting a few to to push forward to to the final to the final rounds. But uh, the the awards will be made in at the end of May in uh, in Stockholm. And I, I should say, I look forward to, uh, to to following that process, and maybe having some of the the finalists on the on the episode on the podcast to talk about some of their ideas. I mean, it sounds like a really interesting process, if nothing else. And, and that would be to fantastic. Some of the ideas. Um, yes, because imagine yeah. we could have any ideas, and so it will be. It, it is All incredibly right. fascinating, and I'm really looking forward to um, to learning from such a global community. So there you go, listeners. Uh, if you have an idea, you want to change the world and win five million dollars, apply. It's, it sounds great, though, and it really does. And, and I look forward to to learning more. Uh, like I said, about about some of the ideas that that come through. That would be great. I mean, we already have about thirteen thousand teams and and individuals that have uh, registered on the website from one hundred and eighty six countries. Wow. Um, well, that's great. Well, thank you, uh, Maria. This is this is fascinating. I, I love kind of this broader perspective on these uh, these kinds of global issues, and, and and your take has been valuable. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Maria. That was helpful. And yeah, like I said, I look forward to seeing what comes of this A New Shape Prize and the kind of ideas that are generated and seeing if there's any way to to, uh, highlight some of these ideas on the podcast. All right. We'll see you next time. Bye. The views and opinions expressed in the podcast are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policies or positions of Humanity in Action.